And welcome again to our occasion to reflect on the coming uh, scriptures for this weekend, which the fourth Sunday of Ordinary Time begins with a section from the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 18, verses 15 to 20. Another section from Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 7, verses 32 through 35. And again, we come to the Gospel of Mark. We're still in chapter 1. Uh, this week continues from last week with verses 21 through 28. So a few reflections first on the continuing story of Mark. Some things I will need to kind of reemphasize uh, from time to time as we go through <clears throat> this year looking at his uh, story. We find Jesus today in the city of Copernicus. Now remember last week he had chosen four disciples or four apostles to uh, share with him the story of spreading the gospel message. Today we find him coming to, as I mentioned, Copernicus. And we find him present in the synagogue, and we find him present on the Sabbath. So those are the first three kind of bits of information that we pick up as we hear the gospel uh, this time. The city of Copernicum, as mentioned before, was an important uh, trade city on the Sea of Galilee in Jesus' time. Also seems to be the place in which Peter had a home, and later on, not today, but on another occasion, may even be the fact that Jesus himself had some kind of home or dwelling there in Copernicum. It was a very prosperous place. It was a, as we as well know, a fishing town. And uh, fishing, of course, was uh, an important industry. It was, for that reason, a crossroad of trade. Many uh, roads came from the east, crossed, uh, came down around the Sea of Galilee, and uh, came through Copernicum. Copernicum, therefore, was also, there's other stories we'll see later on, an excellent place to collect tariffs or tolls. And so, uh, but there was no way around it. You couldn't go anyplace else if you wanted to go south down to Egypt where there was a very good market for fish. Some of this fish, of course, was smoked. It wasn't always fresh, obviously. But it was uh, a, a rather prosperous uh, business. And as we noticed last time, remember that the, the Zebedee father he had his two sons helping him, and hired workers. So the fact that this was a pretty uh, prosperous industry is indicated uh, by even the few texts that, that we have. Now, so Copernicum becomes the place of centering, if one wants, for Jesus' journeys around the Galilee, teaching, of course, the message that the kingdom of God has arrived. Now he comes to the synagogue. The word synagogue, as you will remember, means a gathering place or an assembly. What we're not sure of, uh, because we read back uh, certain understandings, which may or may not be the case in the first century world, but a synagogue being a gathering of people did not necessarily mean that it was a building could have been a place where people regularly uh, gathered uh, to pray. But fundamentally, the synagogue, when it became a building, and there were places which were known as synagogues, were places where people gathered, but they gathered there to study, to appreciate better the Torah, the law. Remember, not everyone had their own Bible or their own scripture. So, these were very important uh, documents or scrolls. They were kept in a very important place. Um, sometimes the place they were kept in was called the Torah, the place of the law. And on th this occasion, 
they would bring out the scroll. Someone who was gifted in reading would read uh, a text from the scripture. Again, remember, not everyone in the first century world knew how to read and write. It doesn't mean they were dumb. It just means that there was really no need for learning how to write. And consequently, if you couldn't write, you probably couldn't read or vice, vice versa. The group that you remember, and they are pictured in this gospel as in the other gospels, was a group known as the scribes, even by the word scribe. Now, they did not belong to either the Sadducee party or the Pharisee party, although sometimes they would be connected with either of them because members of these two groups didn't always know how to read or write either. But being a scribe, therefore, gave you a certain power, your ability to write things down, not only scriptural things, but documents. After all, they became kind of the official lawyers, if you want, to make sure that things were done in a correct way, particularly when property issues came up, and those issues were just as real then as they are in our own time. And sometimes the scribes would hold, rather, positions of some authority, because obviously if they could read the law and uh, write the, a response to the law, they could also be in a position of some uh, leadership quality. So in that sense, the scribes were teachers, because they explained what the text meant. They were lawyers, because they kept things in an orderly, orderly way, and often, we will find the scribes connected with Jerusalem, but they also could be found in other parts of, uh, of the Holy Land. So I uh, back off, I take a little opportunity here to talk about them because this is a group that is frequently mentioned and they of course would have been teachers. Now, in the gospel tradition, according to Mark, Jesus is pictured as a teacher. But you will find that there is very little knowledge about what he taught. We will see later on as we go through the year, when we come to chapter 4 of Mark's story, that Jesus does uh, teach with a device known as the parables. But very little actual message of what Jesus was teaching is recorded in Mark. Much more, Mark is the action gospel. Jesus is doing something. So here he is pictured now as coming to the synagogue. As I say, is it a building, is it a place? But quite assuredly, it is a gathering of people, a gathering of believers. And he does it, they gather on the Sabbath. Now we've spoken before about the importance of the Sabbath in the Jewish tradition and in the ways in which Jesus grew up. The seventh day was a day of rest from the ordinary activities that you had to do, except those that needed to be done, regardless of what day of the week it was, and a day of recreation, of recreating, of by not doing the ordinary things, doing something different, regaining your strength. A good argument still for the Sabbath in our own uh, times. So Jesus now comes to the gathering on the Sabbath. They recognize him as a teacher. As I say, we don't know exactly what he was teaching, but namely that he was, and this of course is the characteristic that is very importantly stressed in Mark's gospel. He was teaching something new. This wasn't just reiterating and here is the tension now between Jesus and the scribes. Because the scribes would take the law and they would read it and they would interpret it. Jesus uh, is something different. He is, he is teaching a, a, a different way, not rejecting the message of the Torah, but bringing something new to it. And this is what creates, as Mark sees it, a tension between the scribes and Jesus. Where does he get this? Where is this power that Jesus has? Where does it come from? And this, of course, becomes a tension throughout the gospel story of Mark, 
Uh, and again, maybe to notice that this is really the first time that this tension now comes to the fore, because there are obviously in the synagogue on that occasion scribes. Now, who they were, how many, we have no, uh, we have no uh, information. But they are going to be listening carefully to this new teaching that Jesus is uh, proclaiming. Now, we also know a little bit of how the service in the synagogue took place on the Sabbath day. Usually, as I mentioned, it would be a reading, first of all, from the scripture. Usual person to do it would be someone who could read. Now, there may have been others besides scribes who could read, but they would not be, uh, they would be more, wouldn't be as regular, let me put it that way. Um, then uh, the interpretation, having brought the scripture out and reading it, and there would be a little ceremony connected with the uh, bringing out of the scrolls. After I remember that, uh, that that's how these works were uh, written and kept. And uh, just as we have certain kind of little ceremonies that we use in our liturgy, well, there were little ceremonies that were uh, in place when the scriptures were brought out. And um, then uh, the teaching would take place, and then there would be a ceremony of putting the scolds back in, into the case. So now here is Jesus in the uh, <clears throat> synagogue group, uh, and uh, while he is teaching, now as I say, did he read from the scripture? It doesn't say he might have. This leads to a very interesting question. Could Jesus read and write? Now, for some of us, we just assume that. After all, Jesus is Jesus. He must have known how to read and write. And the chances are that, that he could have. But uh, not, there, there's no evidence in the New Testament in any of them that Jesus did any of this, okay? A carpenter's son, yes, but reading and writing, but here he is teaching. So you don't have to know how to read and write necessarily to teach. It might be helpful, but not necessarily uh, the case. As he is teaching, there is a man there in the synagogue who at a certain point, now apparently up to this point he has been quiet, who questions Jesus. Uh, now here the word demon or demonic is introduced. Uh, we will find it in a few places throughout the New Testament, particularly in the gospel. The demonic, often connected with uh, the devil. Hard to appreciate for us in our own time how this understanding of, an, of evil resonating in a person was perceived. Now, we all have our images of the demon or of the devil, I'm sure, um, but keep in mind that there is something about this demonic person who challenges Jesus. And um, he, he comes up or he takes place after Jesus has been teaching for a while. So it isn't uh, that he kind of interferes right, right away in the beginning, but um, Jesus cures this man, and the demonic, the spirit, cries out to him, what do you have to do with us, holy one? It's one of the only places in the uh, scripture, in the uh, gospels, in which Jesus is given this title, the holy one of God. We know who you are, they say. Now also, I think it's important to notice, just as an aside, in this gospel, people whom you least suspect know who Jesus is. People whom you would expect recognize who Jesus is, don't. And the group that is going to be the slowest to get it, no matter what happens, is going to be the disciples. They simply often miss whatever Jesus is saying. So isn't it interesting here that this demoniac 
recognizes who Jesus is. Now, of course, we know who Jesus is because as the gospel began, remember I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that from the beginning, Jesus is recognized, as Mark tells the story, as the Redeemer, as the Messiah, as the Christ. So we, the audience, know who Jesus is. Think in a certain way, as I, as I mentioned, that you are hearing this gospel being proclaimed or being read. And so become the audience knows who Jesus is. But the characters in the story, that's a different role. They may not know, or they may not have the wisdom of understanding here. So uh, the demoniac recognizes who Jesus is, the Holy One of God. It's a beautiful uh, uh, title. Now, Jesus performs what we call an exorcism. This, of course, keep in mind that this is not the exorcist of modern times where you have people, and we've had movies and all of that, screeching and spewing out green stuff and all of that, okay? Exorcism here means that someone is caught up in things that do not add up, namely, like we would if you use the arithmetical formula, first and second, one and one rather make two, something like that. The first and second centuries of the common time was filled with stories of spirits uh, who roamed making things incorrect. To be caught up in this kind of spirit is not a moral issue. It's not sinful. See, that's the difference we want to make here. That sometimes, well, this man was a sinful man. And there are other places where Jesus does say, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven or arise and walk. But that story is not the one that's here. Here is a story where uh, how, how you might do this is it just doesn't add up. There is something wrong with this man's perception of things. And the, the world believed that there were a variety of spirits that somehow caused things to go wrong for people. Now, now we will find a, a couple of instances in Mark's story where Jesus confronts the spirits who are, and we call them possession. Now be careful, a possession. What does it mean to be possessed by a spirit? To be possessed by something that causes one to act in a way in which they wouldn't normally act. It doesn't mean that some outside force is coming into the person. If you have a terrible or severe headache, does that not sometimes affect the way in which you deal with things? with people, with circumstances, with situations. So that we could say, the headache possesses you. See, it, it, it takes over, or maybe not completely, but your way, my way of doing things. Uh, I'm, I'm sidetracked, I'm, it, it, it just colors everything. If I have a terrible headache, everything I do, as long as I have it, seems to not be normal. I may not be acting, and then someone would say, you're not acting right today. What's wrong with you? See, so that's a sense of the spirits that the ancient world, the world in which Jesus and his contemporaries grew up with, saw the movement of, 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 of persons. And they could, not knowing how else to say this, would say, well, they're possessed. But it isn't like some force is taking over and controlling the person. What is causing the person to be disrupted is one of these kind of spirits. Now, again, they didn't have medical terms for a lot of these things. Sometimes a person might be uh, not able to put things together in an orderly way for extended period of time. Uh, the, the, now, I don't, 
Some would say, oh, you're just going to ch chalk off the miraculous or the marvelous by trying to find some kind of rational explanation. I'm not doing that either. There certainly are certain elements here that are beyond necessarily our being grasping a clear understanding. So there are a sense that there were forces that seemed to infiltrate the society of the time were probably pretty correct. A point of all of my kind of rambling here is that this is the introduction of Jesus, although we've seen it before, as a healer. And here, Jesus is a healer of a man who kind of is not working in a normal or necessary way. There is a kind of well, an interpretation of this, of Jesus driving out, as it were, this evil spirit from the first reading, which comes from the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, as you know, is the fifth book of the Old Testament of the Bible. The word <coughs> itself uh, means a double taking or a double storying um, or telling the story again. So the fifth book precedes ironically, the fourth, the third, the second, etc. And what uh, the Deuteronomist writer did was picture Moses as retelling the whole story of the Israelites' experience in the wilderness as they were getting ready to enter into the land of promise. This is, uh, in many ways, this book uh, which is made up of two major talks attributed to Moses, would be seen as his farewell address to the Israelites now ready to enter the Holy Land. Um, he would not go in with them. That would be the leadership of Joshua, who he had kind of trained and prepared for this. And so here is Moses now telling the people, be careful at this section that is chosen. Now, uh, the book is one, as I say, great oration, really two great orations of, of Moses. So here we're jumping in because there's a certain point that we want to look at as it relates to what Jesus is doing in the um, gospel today. Here is a polemic that Moses is pictured against the Canaanite priests and their magical rites. So the Canaanite priests, whom, of course, the Israelites were dealing with, felt that they could contact their gods and bring or cause certain things to happen. Now, how does this happen? Well, it happened through um, soothsayers, who kind of had certain wisdom here, through necromancy. Oh, there's a nickel word. Bring, raising up the dead, talking about to the spirits of the dead. Fortune tellers who Moses here is pictured as saying, totally wrong. We don't want the Israelites to be engaged in this. These are abominations. That's the word that, uh, terrible abominations. One of them, maybe, we don't know, we have some evidence that might be that one of these also was child sacrifice. And so here Moses is arguing against the Israelites, don't do any of those things. For God will not abide traffic, this kind of traffic, in the spirit world. So it's here that um, Moses then says, God will send up or raise up one who will teach the right way. There will be a prophet like unto Moses who will come among the people. Now, it's interesting, uh, we don't know who that is. Of course, Christians, and you can see how the scripture says, ah, oh, we know who that one is, who is like unto Moses, is none other than Jesus. So we take a section, I don't think that's the way the Deuteronomist, that is the writer of the book of Deuteronomy saw it, but it's the way in which the liturgy here kind of sees Jesus as casting out the evil spirits. Notice what he said, things that Moses had said they shouldn't be paying attention to. So Jesus is pictured as uh, carrying out that, uh, 
that uh, role. So all of that is at work here in this uh, section that we have uh, th this week. Jesus is an exorcist, and we will see as we go along that there will be a number of other occasions that Mark will remember for us where Jesus exercises this role of casting out the spirit. Now, what is it that he casts out? I know that, and I got to be very careful here, is casting out the devil. There is a way in which we can certainly think of the devil as an evil force, as an evil reality. But perhaps, just as a concluding thought here, we might reflect when we use or think of the devil, do we think of the devil as an identity separate from and outside of the ordinary human cause, course, or do we think of the devil as a way of thinking, a way of acting, a way of being? And uh, it's much easier to say that evil reside, res resides out there than to say that evil resides or re is found within the person. For on other occasions, we will find Jesus saying, where does evil arise? If not, from the thoughts or attitudes and ways of doing things that come from within. So in that sense, the devil, quote, might represent evil or disruptive or things that don't match up. See, uh, keep in mind, for example, that if you are looking for good soil in which to plant something, then you're really grateful as you put soil into the ground that this will be something that will grow. However, to have good soil on your kitchen floor may not be something that your mother would be so grateful for because what you're gonna do is sweep it up and throw it away. So in that sense, see, something in which in one sense can be good in another place when displaced is wrong. That's what goes on in this little episode we have heard, that the spirits are displaced. They are in the wrong place here and therefore causing disharmony or disunity. So another way to see the demonic is that which divides, that separates, that does not cause unity or harmony. Here now emerges Jesus as the healer, bringing into the life situation of people a sense of wholeness, a sense of togetherness, a sense of compassion and goodness. So all of this is to introduce us today in this gospel reading to two primary roles that Jesus will be pictured as exercising, the role of teacher and the role of healer. We will hear a number of stories in Mark's narration as it goes along where Jesus is pictured as a healer. In the end, it does not necessarily mean or prove that Jesus is divine. We know that he is but the action of Jesus as a healer would be something that would have gotten people's attention, would have gotten their uh, interest up. And so as Jesus here in the synagogue on this particular Sabbath day teaches and heals, we see that he is inaugurating the mission, the kingdom. Remember, this is still only chapter one, and uh, we're, we already have learned a lot about Jesus but details not quite so. So this day, we ask that the good spirit of the Lord uh, certainly be with us as we gather uh, together to listen to God's word, to marvel at Jesus, God's teacher among us, and to let his good spirit flow through our lives. Mm -hmm.